Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, and once in a while you have a guest who's just a wealth of information that you cannot cram into 60 minutes. It's hard to cram anybody good into that time frame, but once we got started, I realized there's so much to talk about with our guest today, and he graciously agreed to come back. He's a board-certified OBGYN with a subspecialty in maternal fetal medicine. He's a clinical professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Reproductive Science at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and uh, he has a private practice in New York City. Dr. Nate Fox, welcome back to the podcast. Great to be back. Thanks for having me. That's a chiropractor thing. We'd love to see your back. It, well, in our field, we say we're at your cervix. Oh, in my field, we say we're at your cervicals. Ah, all right. <laughs> we, have in, we have in common cervical. That's it. That's right. We do different types of cervical examination. That's yeah. exactly right. <laughs> love it. Okay. So we were talking about different types of tests and screenings that are done during pregnancy, sometimes even before pregnancy, both for the pregnant woman and the baby or babies that she is carrying. And we ran out of time, third trimester. We didn't get a chance to really talk about that. And it's important. That's when some of the testing is done that requires actionable information that's received. And we also very quickly touched upon aneuploidy testing, which is a type of chromosomal testing that does not have to do with genetics. And it's a deep conversation, so we decided to expand upon it in the second and third segments today. But let's jump right into the third trimester. So during the third trimester, I see different practitioners do ultrasounds at different times. Sometimes I see 32 weeks, sometimes 36 weeks, sometimes both. What are we looking for, and when's a good time to have it done? Yeah, so it's a good question, and for full disclosure, 50% of my job is doing ultrasound, so I'm generally pro-ultrasound. But in general, in the third trimester, there isn't a standard in terms of routine ultrasound, meaning pretty much almost all pregnant women are going to have ultrasounds in the late first and second trimester, and in the third trimester, it depends. So in a routine low-risk pregnancy, there's no need to do an ultrasound, but reasons someone might have one is uh, their doctor suspects either the baby is measuring bigger or smaller than expected. So an ultrasound is one way we can estimate the weight, sometimes to check how much fluid there is around the baby. Occasionally, it's to verify the position. Is the head down? Is the head up? So those would be reasons sort of on a routine pregnancy what to do. Certainly, there's things we follow up, like if we thought the placenta was low, maybe to follow up where the location of the placenta is. And then there's in certain pregnancies that are at increased risk for certain problems, we will more routinely check either how the baby's growing or how the fluid is uh, or the baby's movement or something in that regard. Okay. You just touched on a whole bunch of stuff, and it's the things that sometimes drive our patients crazy. Yeah. So, And I'm sure our listeners who are not just my patients. So. I love yeah, to, we to drive people crazy them. all the time. That's yeah, my job. It's, it's amazing. Great. And my wife is a psychologist, a little plug. All right. So, <laughs> mine too. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> we should have coffee one time. Yeah. We'll meet in Nebraska. All right. So, I don't think you talked about previa, but placenta previa is what? So, placenta previa is when the placenta, its location in the uterus is covering the cervix, which is the exit for the baby out the uterus. And so if the placenta is blocking the exit, it could be dangerous when she goes into labor because she'll bleed a lot. So if we have diagnosed or suspect a placenta previa earlier in pregnancy, it's something we'll follow up on as pregnancy progresses to see if the placenta has moved away from the cervix because it can and usually does. The placenta usually moves up and away from the cervix. So we follow it to sort of decide, has it moved away? And if it has not moved away, then we would have to deliver her by cesarean. Okay. And that's almost universal. I've never seen anybody say, oh, you have a previa, but if you want to, we'll do a vaginal birth. But um, not in the past 125 years, right. pretty much. That's probably why I haven't seen it. <laughs> yeah. I look old, but I haven't been around that long. So <laughs> previa, just a few clarification points. So does it actually move or is it attached to the part of the uterus that is at the beginning low and then grows? So it's moving with the growing uterus. So both. We actually call placental migration. Uh, and there's two ways that the placenta sort of migrates up the uterus. One is what you said where it's implanted in a certain part of the uterus. And as the uterus itself grows, it grows like from the bottom up. So the placenta sort of by default moves away. And the second way is the placenta is continuously, uh, like all cells in our body, 
dividing and growing and dying. And so it preferentially grows on the up direction and dies off on the bottom direction. So it sort of creeps its way up the uterus that way. Tortoise like movement though. It's not gonna yeah. all of a sudden skip to the top like the rabbit. No, no, no. It's it's very, very slow. It's okay. uh, but it only Are... has to move a couple of centimeters. It's not like it has to move a great distance to get away from the cervix. That's gonna be my last question. But right before that, is there anything that you know of that can encourage that kind of movement or can people lay in inversions with that uh not that we know of. Not that we know of. Okay, I didn't think so either. And the same for me. People call sometimes saying, Can you do anything chiropractically, acupuncture? Not that I know of either. And if you know of something I'd love to hear I'm talking to the listeners here and the final thing about previa is how much clearance do you need over the cervix to make the call that vaginal delivery would be safe uh so people differ on this generally almost everyone is going to say it's safe to deliver vaginally if the edge of the placenta is two centimeters away from the opening of the cervix there is some leeway if it's between zero and two centimeters based on what the patient and doctor's tolerance is for bleeding and labor, because that's the risk that they'll have bleeding and labor. And so if it's more than two, pretty much everyone will let them labor. If it's one to two, some will, some won't. It sort of depends on the circumstances if it's less than two. But if it's covering the cervix, for sure not, because that's a real previa. Okay. You mentioned size, that in this ultrasound we're looking for size and weight of the baby, but there is no scale. So how do we determine weight on an ultrasound? Right. So what I explain to patients is we're like the guy at the carnival who looks at you and guesses your weight. <laughs> so, Because we don't, we don't actually weigh the baby. What we do is we take some measurements. Uh, essentially, the current formulas use four measurements. There's two measurements of the head, one measurement of like the waistline, and one measurement of the length of the femur bone. And using those four measurements, there's computer algorithms and formulas that'll calculate the estimated weight as well as a percentile for that gestational age. So we know that it's an estimate. We actually call it the estimated fetal weight. We do not claim that that is the actual weight. And there's an error rate based on how perfect your images are, based on the exact proportions of the baby. But essentially, we're trying to figure out, is the baby measuring very small? very large, or anywhere in between those two. Mm -hmm. That's really the only clinical relevance. It's not the exact weight. So I'm sort of a peacemaker, but I do have this observation because the margin of error, I've heard that a typical margin of error can be plus or minus a pound. Would you say that's accurate? Um, It's plus or minus a pound at the closer to delivery. It's generally by percentage. The margin of error is about 10 to 20%. So if you're saying the estimated weight is eight pounds, 10 to 20% is about a pound, so seven to nine. If you're earlier in pregnancy and you say the baby's weight is a pound and a half, then the error of measurement is not going to be a pound in either direction. It's going to be much, much less than that. Understood. So my patients, uh, a lot of them, are more naturally minded. They would like to give birth uh, without intervention if that's safe. Most of them are open to different kinds of intervention if that's what's needed for the safe outcome. But they're frequently recommended to be induced early, like 39 weeks or so, because the baby's too big, quote unquote, or too small on the estimated fetal weight. My observation is that because doctors, and I don't mean this in a bad way, this is just what mm-hmm. you're trained to do, is because medical doctors look for problems, potential problems, and try to prevent them from happening. When a measurement comes out on the lower side, you start to wonder, maybe this baby's too small. When a measurement comes on the higher side, you start to wonder, maybe this baby's too big. But with the margin mm-hmm. of error, I just see personally a lot of cases where the estimate is like, oh, this baby could be as much as 10 pounds, maybe we shouldn't right. do something. then they come out like eight and a half pounds, or right. and vice versa. So there's a lot in there. It's a little bit different when we're worried about the baby measuring small versus large. First of all, when the baby's measuring small, the accuracy is better because, again, the baby is smaller. And number two, the reason we would, in theory, recommend delivery is because we're actually worried about the baby. Now, again, it's not that if the baby's measuring small, we are therefore worried. There's a lot of other factors we use to determine, is the baby just look small and healthy, right? You know, Many babies are small, many babies are big. There's variation in how humans are built versus is the baby small for some pathologic reason, some concerning reason, like the placenta is not working. So that's its own separate discussion, and it's complex. There's a lot of testing and thought that goes into that. When the baby's measuring on the bigger side, we know that we're frequently overestimating. In fact, we just recently published a study that when you think the baby is big, you're much more likely to be overestimating than underestimating. When we say plus minus a pound, it's usually actually minus a pound. Very rarely is it plus a pound. And so in that circumstance, it's really a discussion with the woman. It's not that we insist that she needs to be induced. And there's also other ways to know 
if the baby's big. I mean, if a woman has a child, has delivered a child before, and we just ask her, how big do you think this baby is? Her estimate is just as accurate as the ultrasound is. And so you have to use all of these factors involved. If, so if, let's say I'm estimating the baby's nine pounds. And she goes, there's no way this baby's nine pounds. I delivered an eight pound baby last time. And this one's measuring smaller to me. She's probably right. And so we're not as concerned. And the other thing is inducing, there's a minus to it and there's a plus to it. And in, you know, there's studies on this and are you increasing the C-section rate or decreasing the C-section rate? But it really should be a discussion. It's not like a rule that if it's A, you have to induce. And if it's B, you don't have to induce. Right. Do you have, off the top of your head, the largest vaginal baby that you've attended? The largest baby that I delivered vaginally was 12 pounds, one ounce. Wow. Yeah. None of us knew the baby was that big. And Mm -hmm. by the way, it was one of the easiest births like ever. The baby just came right out. And I felt like I should put a backpack on the kid and send him to kindergarten. (laughs) So I attended a birth to do, you know, I do doula work. And so the baby was still 11 pounds from a very, very tiny mother. Um, I wouldn't say easy birth, but not any more challenging than a typical unmedicated birth. And she did it unmedicated, vaginally, didn't even tear. And same, when that baby came out, I was like, oh, somebody get a sandwich. She's a large little child, you know. Uh, you know it's hard because we all know, and, and the doctors know this too, that most babies who are very big are going to come out and be fine. Right. The issue is, you know, a lot of people aren't comfortable with the word most. That's mm-hmm. the issue. Like how close to all do you have to get in order for someone to be comfortable? And, you know, that's tough. You know, someone hears there's a 1% risk of something very bad happening. Well, people look at that differently. Some people say, well, that's only 1%. I'd rather, you know, go with the 99% and everything's going to be okay. And they'll usually be right. And other people hear that. And that's like the most horrifying number they've ever heard in their life. And they're terrified. And so you have to try to be as objective about the numbers with people and see where they feel and how they tolerate risk. And again, it's a discussion about what everyone's comfortable with, but Mm. I think it would be inappropriate to make the decision for the patient that it's either a very high risk or a very low risk, and you have to discuss it with her, see how she feels about it. So I agree with you, a million percent risk is subjective. And so one person will hear 1% thinks a lot, one will think it's a little. And also, by the way, one person will hear 1% think it's a little, and then you just rephrase it as one in a hundred, and all of a sudden it sounds like a lot. So Right, right. You have, to under- you have to make sure that people understand what the numbers mean, and different people think of numbers differently, uh, and you have to try to explain it in different ways so everyone's clear of what we're talking about. And at the end of the day, we all make risk-benefit analyses and choose. There's no 100% safe way to get any baby out, really. And so once you present the choices, then that discussion becomes really important to which risks for which benefits somebody's willing to take. They are the one who have to go through it, and they're the ones who deal with the outcome. So I love your approach. We're freaking behind time again (laughs) because you have so much great information. I'm going to take a super quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. We're talking to Dr. Neat Fox, and we're talking about that third trimester ultrasound screening and things that you look for, things that can come up, and sometimes things you have to make decisions based on. Let's talk about fluid, amniotic fluid. We have a whole episode on fluid, but just as a recap, since that's one of the things you're looking for, first of all, the way that fluid is measured, what's the normal range, and what could it mean if you're sort of towards the top or bottom or above or below? So we measure amniotic fluid by ultrasound. There's two sort of, well, three ways we can do it. One is just look by ultrasound and say subjectively, hey, that looks high, hey, that looks normal, hey, that looks low, which is actually fine, uh, but that's one way to do it. Numerically, one way is we divide the belly into four quadrants and then measure the deepest pocket of fluid in each quadrant in centimeters and add up those four numbers. That's called the amniotic fluid index or amniotic fluid volume. And normally it ranges between five and 24 centimeters, which is a big range, which just shows that there's a a whole wide range of normal. And the third way is just look around, find the deepest pocket of fluid and measure it. And it should be between two and eight centimeters. I mean, these are sort of technical things, but essentially we're looking as the fluid too low or fluid too high. And most of the time it's too low or too high. Everyone's fine. It's not that by definition, that's a bad thing. But if it's low, we're concerned that maybe her water is broken, though usually she'll know or maybe the placenta is not working so well and therefore the baby's not quote unquote drinking so much and therefore not peeing. 
because the idea is that amniotic fluid is basically baby pee. The babies swim around in their pee their whole pregnancy. And so if there's very low fluid, the baby's not peeing potentially. And if it's very high, there's other concerns. Again, usually everything is fine. It's just things we want to double check are not going on, uh, like anatomic abnormalities with the baby or sometimes kidney abnormalities. But again, usually it means uh, not that much. Now, I understand why when my kids, uh, when they're toddlers, playing basketball and they pee all over themselves, they just keep playing basketball. They're going back to their fetal state. It's going back and to they drink how it, it used to they be. Also drink, they drink that fluid. Yeah. Well, I haven't seen that in the toddler yeah. spot. <laughs> but yeah, so if it's too high, then what are you worried about there? You know, the most common reasons the fluid is too high by far, number one, that there's nothing wrong whatsoever. There's just babies peeing a little bit more. Sometimes big babies do it. Sometimes babies just pee more. I mean, that's fine. That's the most common reason that it's nothing. And the second most common is that if the mom has gestational diabetes, but usually by then we've already tested for it. And so she doesn't have it, she doesn't have it. All the other reasons are very rare and they tend to be the bad ones. You know, that there's some abnormality with the baby's brain or the baby has an abnormality anatomically in its esophagus or, you know, some genetic condition. Again, they're possible, but they're really, really unlikely if everything else looks normal. And so when I see a woman with high fluid, you know, I'll tell her, we'll talk about it, but I really reassure that almost always this means nothing. Mm -hmm. Uh, And ultimately, all the other things you can't really diagnose till after birth. And sometimes the only practical implication is when she breaks her water, it's going to be a mess. So I tell her, you know, don't wear expensive shoes, warn the people on the floor below you, you know, (laughs) everyone's ready. There's going to be a lot of water coming out. Oh, I did see an OB get quite a squirt full in his face from a woman who had high. (laughs) She had a lot of fluid and uh, he just checked at the wrong time. Yeah. So now he wears a face shield wherever he goes. So in your understanding, to your knowledge, is there anything that can be done to either raise a lower fluid number reading or lower a higher fluid number reading? basically no. You know, some people say, oh, if there's high fluid, there's nothing she can do to lower it. If there's low fluid, in rare, rare circumstances, it'll have something to do with how much she's drinking, but almost never. It's Mm -hmm. almost never because she's dehydrated that there's low fluid. So basically no. Right. So I've seen recommendations. I don't know how well they work for someone who has lower fluid to rest and drink more. And for someone who has higher fluid, especially if they're eating a lot of sugar, you know, tropical fruits, things like that to lower their sugar intake. So perhaps, you know, more sugar in the bloodstream equals more pee, I guess is the theory. So less sugar in the bloodstream equals less pee. It anecdotally seems to help, but I haven't seen it backed up by anything medical. Yeah, I don't know. I don't I don't find that those things help so much, if anything minimal. And for most people, it doesn't. And generally just drives people crazy. And it also, <laughs> it, you know, also it, it sort of stems from this philosophy that I am very much opposed to, that all the things that happen in pregnancy that are not normal are the woman's fault, mm-hmm. that somehow she's you know, in control and it's because she did this or she did that. And that's how everyone sort of walks around thinking. And it's really not the case. It's almost always entirely out of her hands. And we're just you know, observing and trying to pivot when it happens. Sure. Um, other than being nervous because the fluid's on the higher or lower side, reasons why I see women wanting to try and manipulate the fluid level are either because it may be affecting the baby's position, which we'll talk about next, or because they're being threatened with induction because the fluid's too high or too low. So I've just seen a lot of people try a lot of different things. And I had uh, recently had a midwife who wasn't going to be induced early for it, but her baby was stuck in a breech position. And and just with very little fluid, they didn't think she had much chance of the baby moving. So she tried all sorts of things to raise her fluid level, including a bag of IV fluid every day. And her levels didn't really change very much. So, um, Yeah, that's actually a problem. Because you, if you do a bag of IV fluid every day, she's very unlikely to increase the fluid in the uterus. And she's very likely to increase the fluid in her own lungs. Oh. And that's going to be good. Yeah, I don't think it wasn't didn't go on very long. It was like three days in a row to see if it would make oh, okay. a big difference and, and no notable difference, which is why she stopped. It's been looked at. The only thing, drinking extra water sometimes increases it a little, but certainly not intravenous. It's not necessary. Mm. So in terms of position, that's one of the things that you look for before delivery. Obviously, everybody likes to see a head down baby. If the baby is not head down, either transverse or some form of breach, in your mind, are there things that can be done to correct that? It depends when you find it. I mean, a lot of people worry about the position of the baby when it's earlier in pregnancy. And 
for most people, when it's found earlier, the baby is going to find his or her way to head first. Mm -hmm. uh, I tell people not to worry about it so much, particularly if it's not her first baby, because a lot of times those babies sort of float around for a while until the end. But if you're really getting towards, you know, 35, 36, 37 weeks and the baby's still not head down, I mean, there's a lot of options. Uh, and we talked to her about them. She can choose not to do anything. And if the baby's not head down, she's either going to have a cesarean delivery or find a provider who's going to deliver her breech. Uh, we offer a procedure called an external cephalic version where we manipulate the baby with our hands externally on her belly and move the baby to head down, which is a pretty successful and it's a safe procedure. We do that. A lot of women see people like you to have their, you know, sort of bodies manipulated and, you know, with varying levels of success, it's certainly safe. And if it works great, some people try acupuncture. I haven't found acupuncture to be as successful as compared to just waiting. But, you know, again, it's one of these things where it's hard to know for sure. There aren't huge studies on it and it's certainly safe, you know, and some people try doing stuff with people who don't know what they're doing. And I get a little troubled by that sometimes if, you know, non-professionals having them contort themselves into these very strange positions where they can get hurt. But most of the time, it's either waiting or seeing someone who knows what they're doing to try to manipulate either her body or the baby into the right position. Yeah, so in Chinese medicine, the acupuncture is one thing, but the moxibustion is where they're, uh, yeah. they're stimulating the same points with an herbal stick that has mugwort in it, which is a little bit of a sedative. I think the idea is that the wall, the muscular wall of the uterus relaxes a little bit and the baby responds to that with more movement. There is at least one JAMA study on that that seems to indicate that it does cause movement. Yeah, most of the overall studies on moxibustion have not been so promising. Most of them have showed it's not much different compared to doing nothing. And it's totally harmless. I mean, it's not like a problem to do it, but I haven't you know, seen good data that it's effective. That's the only issue. So I see it as effective in conjunction with what I'm doing. So I, I do body work to try to loosen up the lower back, hips, and pelvis. You know, one of the things that we see is, is breach on people who are very athletic, who are very mm -hmm. stiff, tight, rigid, low back, hips, and pelvis, and perhaps the baby's really not that, when they run out of space, not that eager to go there. If we can open up some space there, or if the baby is trying to move and the body's resisting the movement instead of accommodating the movement, if we can open up some space by digging into those muscles that are super tight and loosening them up and then opening those joints that are not moving very well, we don't do anything to the baby. We just make a space that perhaps if the baby is trying to move, then they'll be more successful on their own. That in conjunction with moxa, because moxa does seem to create more movement, if we can open the space and then do moxa, again, anecdotally, we have no big study on it, uh, shows Great. that it seems to be a little more successful. Okay, the shape of the uterus, is that something mm -hmm. you can see? Because, uh, you know, I see these patients with bicornate uterus, the little yeah. shaped uterus, that are more likely to be breached and less likely to get out of it. Is that something you look for and that you can see at varying stages of pregnancy? It's hard to see during pregnancy. The best tests, unless you're like operating on someone and actually like holding or looking at the uterus with your eyes, the best way to know sort of non-invasively is either a certain form of ultrasound where we put water inside the cavity or an MRI, but you really have to see the uterus in the non-pregnant state to get a good sense of what's going on. Uh, and we do see this. It's one of the reasons people seek out our care because those pregnancies uh, you know, probably about 3% of people, give or take, have an abnormally shaped uterus, you know, plus minus. And those pregnancies tend to be higher risk for a lot of reasons. One of them is a much higher risk of breech presentation or head up and cesarean delivery. But there's other risks like preterm birth and how the babies are going to grow and actually an increased risk of high blood pressure in some of these conditions. And so we definitely see a lot of women for this. And when women come to us after, let's say, a complicated pregnancy, one of the things we try to assess in the non-pregnant state is what is the shape of her uterus because it'll affect what we recommend and what we do in the next pregnancy. When you see breech babies and they've tried everything, let's say they did the chiropractic acupuncture, yeah. massage, positional things, ECV, still no turn. Yeah. Are there any positions of breach that you see as deliverable vaginally? So it depends what you mean by deliverable, right? So all babies can be born breech, and all babies who are breech used to be born vaginally. The issue like me. is, yeah, I was. Yeah, the issue is, I mean, there's been a major shift in the U.S. and actually worldwide to not deliver these babies vaginally. And some people argue that's a good thing. Some people argue that's a bad thing. I think in some cases it's good, in some cases it's bad. And what happened was over the years, two things happened. Number one, 
a cesarean delivery became much safer, meaning from 1950 to 2000, you know, the problems of having a cesarean, you know, decreased significantly, the likelihood of a major complication. And number two, there was a greater focus in birth on the outcomes related to the baby rather than just the mother. So if you look in the you know, mid 20th century and earlier, pretty much the entire goal was to have the mother get out of delivery okay. And you know, everyone was happy if the baby did well, but it wasn't really the focus. And then in the second half of the 20th century, you know, fetal monitoring got put in and then we worried about breach because there are babies who get injured from breach deliveries. It's rare. Most babies do not get injured from breach deliveries, but it happens. And so what happened was, fewer people were offering breech deliveries. And at the same time, fewer people were being trained in breech deliveries. And these things sort of spiraled. And then sort of in the end of the 20th century, there was a very big study that showed that babies, where they really like randomized women to be you know, delivered vaginally or cesarean delivery for a breech. And the babies who were attempted vaginal delivery did worse. They had worse outcomes. Now, again, it wasn't like it was horrific, but there was a small percentage of them that got injured and you know, had major injuries. And because of that, pretty much everyone in the U.S. stopped doing vaginal breech deliveries for one baby. Not everyone, but almost everyone. So we don't really do them uh, anymore for Singleton. We do them for twins, for the second twin, which is actually um, not a lot of people do. It's a different scenario. Again, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing depends on the circumstance, but that's just the reality in the U.S. Sure. Yeah, I mean, here in Los Angeles, we still have some options of doctors who are, never really stop doing vaginal breech delivery <laughs> as an option, meaning, right. you know, all else fails, they give you the option. And some of them only do it, you know, all of them have criteria, so safety right. criteria, selection, and I think that's what was missing from the term breach trial that you mentioned was there was not a great deal of selection. Some of the doctors in that trial didn't really have experience delivering breach babies. Many of the facilities had no NICU, so it's a little hard to compare the outcomes yeah. of that study. Plus, their two-year follow-up study found no long-term difference right. in health in the two-year-olds. So. Yeah. You know, it seems harsh to take away the choice, especially if somebody has, we just had a patient recently, two seven-pound babies delivered vaginally head down. Third one happened to be Frank Breach, and uh, her doctor's like, you know, really, you should have the choice here, but I have no idea how to deliver a Breach baby, so we got to do a C-section. Uh, yeah. so that's sort of... Um, yeah. In that circumstance, that's tough. I agree. I mean, I think most people realize that that would be a pretty straightforward breach delivery, and the likelihood of an injury to the baby is very, very low. And the likelihood of a successful vaginal delivery is very, very high. And Not, I think, but that also doesn't take into account the complications that could occur, A, from the cesarean, which you said are also low, but real. perhaps in a subsequent pregnancy <laughs> because she's already had a, a cesarean. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And again, there are definitely circumstances where it's a detriment that she's not going to have a vaginal breach delivery. It's a complex issue and there's more that goes into it. Again, there's training. Do people feel comfortable doing it? Is the environment welcoming of it? Meaning in your hospital, are the nurses, are the administrators, is everyone going to be sort of supportive? Are they going to think you're doing something crazy? And then also if something adverse does happen, which happens in any birth potentially, what's going to happen to the patient, the doctor? Is he going to get sued? Is there going to be like lose your privileges? Like there's a whole like meta discussion about this and it makes it very complicated. Right. I couldn't agree more. There's a tremendous amount of liability about doing something that's not the community norm. Right. And liability is risk to the practitioner and the facility, but doesn't necessarily mean risk to the patient and her baby. Yeah. And that's where hopefully the conversations will some point lead to solutions because around here, the doctors who are doing vaginal breach delivery are getting kind of at the end of their career. Yeah. And so we feel the rope running out. Okay, let's move on. We could do a whole episode on that. I'm going to send yeah. you my documentary called Heads Up, The Disappearing Art of Vaginal Breach Delivery. Oh, cool. See what your thoughts are on that one. A uh, couple more things before we go to the break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about aneuploidy chromosomal testing. The two things I want to get to are the cord and things that you can see about the cord. So I recently had a patient with a funic presentation of the cord. I've had patients with velamentous cord insertion and then marginal cord insertion. What do these things mean? So just in order, funic presentation means that when you do an exam, this is at the end of pregnancy, the cord is the first thing that's presenting to the cervix, meaning instead of the baby's head pushing against the cervix, the cord is between the baby's head and the cervix. We call that a funic presentation. And the risk to that in labor is if the cord drops out of the cervix, that's called a cord prolapse, and that is quite dangerous. 
for the baby because then the cord gets compressed and there's no oxygen coming in, there's no carbon dioxide coming out. So when we see a funic presentation, it's complicated how to manage that. You want to really get that cord out of the way. Is there uh, a way to do that? Not reliably. Usually it's found um, sort of accidentally. And if you, know, you examine and you feel the cord, you either try to push the cord up and guide the head down and it works or it doesn't, but it can be, I don't want to say a scary situation because you know what we're doing, but it could be a very um, intense situation because sometimes you literally, I mean, this is one of these scenes on the labor floor where, you know, the doctor is examining and the cords coming out and they're holding the head up and the cord up and literally you're recommending a C-section but as you're wheeling the patient down the hallway, the doctor is sitting on the bed between her legs with his or her hand holding the baby's head and the cord up with the sheet over everybody. It's really weird, but it's kind of like an emergent situation. Made for uh, TV. What, yeah, so that's, but it happens. But that's what could happen with Unic. So they uh, recommended cesarean at 36 and a half weeks, actually, when they saw it. And uh -huh. um, she had it because they really didn't want her to go into labor. Yeah, there isn't a standard for what to do because there's a very good percentage of them that will, the cord will move out of the way as the head comes down, but what if not? So, you know, it really depends on a lot of circumstances. Is your cervix open? Is it closed? I mean, there's different ways. I'm not sure. It's hard to, to say if that was too aggressive or not aggressive enough. I mean, who knows? Yeah, and we don't have all the details. I'm, I'm not judging yeah. it. I'm just saying it yeah. seemed like uh, yeah. uh, this doctor in particular is not generally very interventive, and that's why yeah. it struck me as this must have really scared her. Yeah, because if she breaks her water and goes into labor, it could be a disaster. And so it's a tough situation. It's rare. We don't usually see it. That's what she said also. I think yeah. she said it's the first time she's seen it in 15 rare. years. Um, so. A velamentous cord insertion just refers to how the cord inserts into the placenta. The cord is basically like a rope with three blood vessels in it that sort of twist on itself. And usually it just plunks right into the middle of the placenta. Velamentous is when the cord sort of stops a little bit early, and then these three blood vessels sort of travel through these thin membranes and then along the placenta. And there's a couple concerns with that. Most of the time, nothing happens, but any placenta that's built a little bit differently, we worried is also going to function a little bit differently. And so if it's you know funky in its architecture, maybe it's not going to provide all the nutrients the baby needs. So that's one potential concern. Uh, the other is if those blood vessels in those thin membranes happen to cross the cervix, that's something called the vasa previa, which is terribly dangerous and is a big problem in obstetrics. And we actually deliver them at 35 weeks when that happens, because wow. if they break their water, that blood vessel can actually rupture and that's the baby's blood. And in that situation, if you actually don't know it's there, there's a 50% mortality, 50% of the babies will die. So that's something that when we see it, we take very seriously. It's rare, but that's one of the concerns. And then sometimes in labor, the heart rate will drop more because those blood vessels can get compressed. But that's velamentous. And that's something we see early in pregnancy. That's not a late finding. That's an early finding. Marginal cord insertion just means instead of the cord entering like the bullseye of the placenta, it's sort of off to the side. And that usually has no consequences whatsoever. We mostly ignore that. It doesn't mean that much. Okay, and you said that the uh, rope, that is the umbilical mm -hmm. cord, has three vessels running through it, but sometimes it only has two, right? So a yeah. single umbilical mm -hmm. artery, is that a concern? Uh, when we see it, it's, usually everything's normal. It happens, you know, 2 to 3% of the time. And sort of like velamentous, it's one of these things where we just get concerned if something is off with how the placenta is built, placenta and cord, we worry that maybe it won't function well. So we do follow to make sure the babies are growing okay. It's not a concern for genetic abnormalities if that's the only thing that's there. And then occasionally it can also indicate a slightly higher risk of a heart defect in the baby. So we just look at the heart extra close. And again, almost always nothing else is going on. Almost always it's just two vessels instead of three. The baby doesn't need three vessels in order to you know, transport oxygen and food and nutrients. And so we just make sure everything's looking okay and then mostly it's fine. So usually two arteries in one vein. And Correct. if it's two vessels, then just a single artery and Correct. one vein. Okay. Yeah, two-vessel cord is also called single umbilical artery, as you single said. Artery. All right. So the last one in here is calcification of the placenta. Right. So that's basically an ultrasound finding where the placenta, instead of looking like a dark gray, is going to have like white splotches in it, and that's calcification. We used to do an ultrasound grade placentas, like give the placenta grade based on how much calcification but what we've learned over the years is that's really meaningless. 
meaning how a placenta looks on ultrasound and how it's functioning on ultrasound are not well correlated. So we may comment on it, but we really pretty much nowadays don't intervene or do anything different based on seeing calcifications in the placenta. Does it matter how early you see it or to what degree you see it? Uh, I mean, in theory, it would if it meant much, but since it doesn't mean much, we really don't focus on it. We almost ignore it. Okay, beautiful. I mean, you just answered the most common questions I get about <laughs> that really on an every single day basis. And for that reason, I'm pretty sure this will be one of the most popular episodes of our podcast. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, you, of course, have your own podcast, which is called the Healthful Woman Podcast. And what's your format? What do you guys talk about? Yeah, so basically, uh, I'm the host, and it's me and a guest. It could be anybody. It's either one of the doctors in my practice or a doctor from elsewhere or a midwife or a nurse or a yoga instructor, whoever it might be. And essentially, our goal of the podcast is to get, similar to what you're doing, is to really give good, reliable, understandable information to women and men about women's health related to either pregnancy, related to gynecology, related to wellness, and to also keep it light and interesting. And I've been very pleased with how it's going. It's not my profession. I see patients every day. I do this on my spare time, but I believe in it. I think that finding good information is so difficult for people because of the vast wealth of options to find stuff. People often find bad information. So we started doing the podcast. Each one's about 30 to 60 minutes. We drop two a week. And it's a a wide range of topics, but it's been awesome. It's been really cool. I I direct my own patients to it and they send it to their friends and people who I don't know. And, you know, we take requests and we have an email and it's been a lot of fun. And just to say, some people are really brilliant at what they do in medical fields, but have a hard time breaking that information down into understandable tidbits for people who don't know medical terminology 101. And also kind of like an honest, fair and balanced approach, meaning where you think a medicine is doing a good job in obstetrics and gynecology and where you think there's room for improvement. So it's a really refreshing approach, uh, just even having you on my episode of the podcast, but I will 100% be listening to your Healthful Woman podcast because I learned so much by interviewing you just on this one episode. All right, when we come back, talking about breaking down challenging topics into easy to understand or easier to digest tidbits of information, one of the more complicated ones is aneuploidy chromosomal testing. What does that mean? We will find out in just a moment. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. We're talking to Dr. Nate Fox. Okay. In our first episode with Dr. Fox, we talked a little bit about chromosomal testing for things that are genetic, things that you pass on that you might be a carrier for, your partner might be a carrier for, and you pass on to your child. But there's this whole other category of chromosomal issues that can come up, and they're called aneuploidy testing. Euploid. Well, why don't you describe what aneuploidy means? Yeah, I mean, aneuploidy is a fancy word. Maybe people remember it from high school biology, but you know, we are what we call euploid, which is we have 46 chromosomes in every cell in our body, which is arranged in 23 pairs. That's called euploid. That's E-U-P-L-O-I-D. Again, it's a fancy word that's unnecessary. And then aneuploid means you don't have that. So you either have an extra chromosome, like you have 47 chromosomes in every cell, or a missing chromosome, you have 45 in every cell. And there are a lot of conditions that are related to that. One of them is Down syndrome, where you have an extra 21st chromosome, for example. And they're genetic in that the problem is related to your genes, but as you said, they're not inherited from your parents, meaning a baby that's born with Down syndrome, the parents, neither of them has Down syndrome, they don't carry Down syndrome. But what happens is in the development of the egg, it has an abnormal number. And this got a lot of attention because it's well known that as women get older, the risk of having a baby with one of these conditions goes up. It's not zero when you're young, it's just very low. So maybe it's, let's say, one in a thousand when you're 20 years old, and by the time you're 40 years old, it's one in 40 or one in 50. And so what happened over the years is there's essentially an option for people to see if their baby has one of these conditions. And it's very confusing for people because it takes a lot of understanding to figure out what's going on and what the options are. And this is one of the areas in pregnancy where I think women are the, I guess, most confused, as are their doctors. 
it's hard to explain. So the way I break it down to people is that these are conditions that can happen in any pregnancy to any woman. They're more likely as you get older. And there's really three paradigms for what you can do. You can either take option, and this is not in hierarchical order, this is just three options. Option A is you can say, I'm not doing any testing or screening. The most likely outcome is my baby's gonna be healthy. If my baby does, has one of these conditions, I'm not gonna have an abortion. I'm gonna love the baby, raise the baby. We'll figure it all out after birth. And I don't wanna be stressed with these tests during pregnancy. Fine, that's one option, perfectly legitimate, absolutely a choice for women. On the other end of the spectrum is option, let's say C, which is you say, I want to know 100%, does my baby have one of these conditions? I don't want any doubt. I want to know yes or no, whether I will terminate or won't terminate, I want to know. In that regard, you would do a definitive invasive test like an amniocentesis or a CVS. You are testing genetic material from the baby. It's no different from doing a blood test on the baby after birth, and you will find out 100%. The middle option is you do what's called a screen. And a screen is you do some test that's not invasive. So it's an ultrasound, it's a blood test, it's a combination of an ultrasound and a blood test. And those screens will give you a numerical score. What is your risk in this pregnancy of having a baby with one of these conditions? And based on that number, if it's very reassuring, you may say, okay, I'm done. I'm not doing any more testing. And you sort of shift towards the option A. Or this number is concerning and I'm going to shift towards doing an invasive test. And that's really it. So the first choice a woman has to make is, which one of those three options do I want to do? Do I want to do no testing whatsoever? Do I want to just jump to the invasive testing and get an answer? Or do I want to do the non-invasive screen and sort of find out more precise what my risk is and then decide? And I think people don't even realize they have those three options. They're either told, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and, and they're sort of lost in what's going on. But that's the first choice a woman should make. And all three of those choices are completely reasonable and should be honored if that's what she chooses. And within the screening and the option B, there's a lot of options and differences and pluses and minus. Fine. So that's like details. But I think taking a step back, people don't realize they have that choice. If you do a screening, go for the middle choice. Mm -hmm. And then something doesn't look right, how far into the pregnancy can you do the more invasive testing, the CVS or the right. amnio? So one of the nice things about the technology we have available now is you can do those screening tests and get a tremendous amount of information back by 11, 12, or 13 weeks of pregnancy to the point where if the screening tests come back normal, the chance of a baby with Down syndrome will be one in 10,000, some crazy low number. And if it's abnormal or concerning, she's still early enough to do the CVS test, which is the first test available anyways. The first time you can do an invasive test is around 11, 12, 13 weeks anyways. And so doing the middle option does not delay any potential invasive test. And if you, know, you start it a little bit later or you want more time to think about it, you can do an amniocentesis anytime after 16 weeks. Through the um, end? You can technically do an amniocentesis in labor. I mean, you could do it at any point technically. The difference is it takes two weeks to get your results and oh. this. And so, you know, at a certain point, they're like, there's no point in doing it anymore. But usually it's done between 16 and 20 weeks because that's sort of the time people will make a decision. But from a technical standpoint, it'd be done at any time. CVS is the one where after you get past 13 weeks, you really don't do it anymore. You would just wait till 16 weeks to do an amnio. And we sort of talked about on the first episode with you, the difference between those two things practically is in one of them, you're measuring genetic information from the amniotic fluid, right? Mm -hmm. That's the amniocentesis. And right. then with the CVS, you're actually going into the placenta. Right, right. I mean, the placenta and baby come from the same clump of cells. Mm -hmm. And so they have the same genetic material. And so if you test the placenta and you get the genetics of the chromosomes from the placenta, they will match that of the baby. There's a 1% chance that that's not the case, in which case we realize that and we say, okay, you have to now do an amnio a month from now. I don't call it a risk because it's not really a risk, but that's sort of a possibility that's going to happen when you do a CVS that you may have to do an amnio, but it's about 1% of the time. The chance of a complication from each procedure is the same. Can you mention some of the other aneuploidy chromosomal abnormalities besides Down syndrome? Right. So for aneuploidy, the common ones are Down syndrome, which is trisomy 21, an extra 21st chromosome. There's trisomy 18 and trisomy 13. 
those two conditions are much more severe, meaning I think most people either know or have met somebody with Down syndrome. Most people have not known or met somebody with trisomy 18 or 13 because almost all those babies don't survive either to birth or after birth. There's another condition called Turner syndrome, which is a woman who's missing one of her X chromosomes. That condition is actually much different. Almost always they have normal intelligence, normal lifespan. They tend to be a little bit shorter and they can have heart conditions, which are diagnosable and they tend to have infertility. So that's a big difference in diagnosis. You know, that and trisomy 13, like trisomy 13 is a lethal disorder and Turner syndrome, they're basically, you know, healthy women you know, some challenges, but nothing, you know, to the same degree. So there is a wide range. Uh, is there and, the opposite of that too? A guy who has an X chromosome? Uh, so when, or an extra X chromosome? Right. So there is a condition, it's called Kleinfelter syndrome. And again, most of those men are healthy, but sterile. And so that's, again, something when you diagnose it, you know, some people get very worried about it, but many after they hear the details of the condition say, oh, you know, intelligence is likely going to be normal and lifespan is likely going to be normal. And so it's not quite the same devastating news per se. I would also say in today's day and age, there's so many other ways to become a parent. Mm, absolutely. That, yeah. That didn't I mean, used to exist. Correct. I mean, finding out that your child is going to have issues with fertility is obviously very painful and very difficult, but it doesn't have the same practical implications that it once did. Uh, meaning whether it's Turner's or Kleinfelder's can have children, they just may need some assisted reproduction. And remember, you're talking, it's going to be 20 years from now. So the technology is going to be even that much better than it is today. And so, you know, that's typically the case. The other sort of wrinkle is that there are conditions they're not called aneuploidy, but where the DNA, there's extra or missing pieces of DNA that can only be diagnosed by an invasive test, a CVS or amniocentesis. So for example, that might be one of the reasons why a woman would choose invasive testing versus screening, because the screening, even if it's perfect, it's really only referring to like three or four genetic conditions. It's not referring to all of them. And so she may want to get as much information as possible and do an invasive test. I have a close friend, a couple, who um, had a baby with trisomy 13. I yeah. believe they only did screenings, and they knew there was stuff going on. Yeah. But they decided not to do the invasive screening, mm -hmm. is my understanding. And they knew very quickly after birth that the baby had trisomy 13. I don't know if they tested her blood or whatnot. And they decided, knowing that something was quite off, they decided they wanted to follow through and have the baby anyway. They were told probably not more than six months to a year is the survival rate on her. She just had her second birthday, mm -hmm. and she's starting to take steps, and she's very interactive, and she's their baby. I mean, she's yeah. like any of their other children. I know that it's such a personal choice, and I, I don't know how people make that choice, but in terms of counseling, are there suggestions that you give people how to pick one of these three options, or if they find more information about chromosomal abnormalities, what to do with that information? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult. And I think one of the big challenges we have in pregnancy nowadays is we have so much information and such high-level detailed testing, but to really understand it takes a tremendous amount of counseling. And that A, takes a lot of time, and B, takes a lot of expertise, and C, takes a lot of communication skills. And so it's difficult. I spend a lot of time with patients talking about this. We have genetic counselors. We have actually a medical geneticist on our team. We have a whole group of people, but not everyone has access to those services. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's part of the reason we do our podcast. We did an hour on this on the podcast, an hour on invasive testing, an hour on carrier screening. I mean, you're talking about, there's a lot of stuff. There are good resources on the internet, but it's hard. In terms of what I actually counsel women about, you know, it really depends a lot on what is their comfort with risk. How do they view a 1% risk of something? Is that something that worries them? Is it something that doesn't worry them? How do they view the possibility of having a baby with a genetic condition? Is it something that would basically drop them into a comatose state? Or are they okay and welcoming and open? And like you said, this is our child, this is our family, and sort of people view these things very differently. And so it has to be an individual choice. This is not something where the doctor can dictate to you what's the right thing or wrong thing to do. None of this testing makes the baby healthier. 
right? All of this testing is just information and different people will go to different lengths to get information based on how much they want it or how much it's going to affect their decisions or their life. And it's a challenge, not in a difficult way or a bad way, but it's an art to try to help someone decide where are they and what do they feel about this and what's the right choice for them as a woman, as a family. And then there's also nuances like, you know, your friends with the baby with trisomy 13, it's possible that the baby has what's called the mosaic trisomy 13, which is you know, some of the cells are normal, some of the cells are abnormal, and then the outcomes are quite variable. And, you know, if someone has a diagnosis in their baby, there are resources, there are pediatricians and geneticists who care for these children, who can tell families what is the range of options. They can never pin down exactly what it's going to be, but say this is best case scenario, worst case scenario, and people can decide for themselves. This is one of those situations where people really have to make decisions for themselves about what's right for them or their family. And there's so many factors. I think even the same person or same couple, different phases in life might make a different sure. choice. Where are sure. we yeah. in our relationship? Is our relationship strong enough for this? Uh, where are we in our financial health? Uh, spiritually, where are we? And in terms of other kids that we have to raise and, and our own mental health, where are we? So there's no right or wrong answers. It's a very deeply personal choice and it's a difficult one to make. And I think that what you're saying is with genetic counselors and people who really have the expertise and have the time, you know, seems like a great idea. I had a couple not too long ago, about a year ago, who found out their baby was going to have Down syndrome. And her doctor was really pushing very hard to terminate the pregnancy. And she didn't want to. She's a very um, spiritual, religious woman. And eventually she switched to another doctor and had the same problem. And it wasn't until she had a third doctor who said, you know, that's your personal choice. I'm going to support whatever you yeah, I mean, that seems very inappropriate to me. I mean, to tell a patient that she should terminate a pregnancy, I mean, that's totally personal. I mean, the only circumstance where we not so much push to terminate, but make sure people understand is if we think there's a condition that's lethal, right? Where the baby's not going to survive. Again, it doesn't mean she should terminate for it. I mean, many do, but okay. Our management of her pregnancy and her delivery might be different, so for example, we have a lot of women in our practice who choose not to do any screening whatsoever. They say, we're not going to do any screening. Fine. That's great. And then an ultrasound, we sort of see something that indicates a baby may have one of these conditions. And if it's lethal, I'll tell her, listen, you don't want any screening. You don't want to know. But if your baby has a lethal condition, for example, we would not do a cesarean under any circumstance, right? Because you wouldn't do a cesarean to quote unquote, save the baby if the baby is not going to survive after birth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, different interventions you might do differently. So sometimes the information is needed just to help her and us make other decisions during pregnancy. But for a doctor to tell a patient that she should terminate a pregnancy, unless for some reason it's putting her life at risk, which is really not the case with the genetic condition, that just seems not appropriate. We just delivered a baby literally yesterday morning with Down syndrome. I mean, this is something that it's her choice completely. How she You have a to. sense on, for Down syndrome specifically, what percentage of people choose to move forward and what percentage of people choose to terminate? So it really depends regionally. A lot of this is actually blue state, red state. It actually mm -hmm. works a lot like that. I mean, in a lot of the states where Traditionally, like abortion, there's more restrictive laws and people tend to be more conservative and maybe more observant religious, so to speak. There tends to be less termination and less screening. And in the more quote unquote liberal states where, you know, it tends to be more, but it's also on an individual level, sort of where they are religiously. I don't know the, the national percentages on this. I would say in, in the Upper East Side of New York City, more people would terminate than not terminate, but that's just a very regional thing. I think that California and Los Angeles is very blue. And I think the point that he was making is uh, almost all of his patients choose to terminate and that um, okay. she doesn't know what she's getting into. I agree with you that it's really we're, our job to present the information and then have a person or a couple think about it and support whatever choice they make. But, you know, I do think, again, I come from this perspective that anybody who spends as much time as you spend to become a medical doctor in general, an OBGYN in particular, in your case, an MFM on top of that, is not getting into the field so that they can boss people around. You're getting into the field because <laughs> you care about what you're doing and want to help people out, and you devote your whole life to doing that. And so sometimes I think you care so much that you want them to make the choice that you would make. And it's hard to separate from that, I think, is what was happening in that case. All right, Dr. Nate, our time is up again. 
not immediately, but I know for sure I'm going to be reaching out to you to cover more right. topics. And in the meantime, I'm going to be listening to your podcast, the Healthful Woman Podcast. Where can we find you online? So our podcast, if you want to find us, we have a website. It's healthfulwoman.com. That's one word, H-E-A-L-T-H-F-U-L-W-O-M-A-N.com. Or you can find our podcast anywhere you get podcasts, uh, Apple, Spotify, Google, SoundCloud, whatever. For my own practice website, it's www.mfmnyc.com. That's like maternal fetal medicine, NYC, New York City.com. That's my whole practice. Or you can just, you know, find me walking around the Upper East Side of Manhattan or New Jersey and, you know, say hello to me on the street. Sounds wonderful. I, <laughs> I'm face blind, so I'll never be able to recognize you on the street, but I will do coffee with you soon. I know it. Thanks again for joining us and for sharing your wealth of information in such a compassionate way. If you'd like to find us online, we're at informedpregnancy.com or on Instagram at Dr. Berlin, D-O-C-T-O-R-B-E-R-L-I-N.